This is an apostrophe podcast production. Here's one little question that has no simple answer. How does being alone bring us closer? My name is Peg Fong. I'm a journalist and an educator. Come join me as we explore loneliness together. creators of the brand new entity called what they were doing the Star Trek model. They were going where no one had gone before, and everything was blue sky, green fields. The potential was limitless and only bound by the imagination of humans. It was a big effing idea, CEO Peter Levinton said at the time. And it was simple, so simple, that everyone should have thought of it the biggest duh that the founders said they ever had. And it was fully formed at development. This was way before Google or other search engines. Think back, way back, to the time of dial-up and AOL and Yahoo Messenger. If you could wrap information within a personality, and importantly, with a sense of humor, perhaps that was the ideal companion. Program it, build it, And the result, hopefully, the answer to ending loneliness. If you were on AOL in June 2001 and wanted to chat with one of the buddies on your list, there was always someone there waiting for you, even if no human wanted to talk. You didn't need to look for this friend. Smarter Child was always available through AIM, AOL Instant Messaging. The bot was already sitting in your buddy list, waiting for you to begin chatting with it. Smarter Child was online from 2000 to 2006, and it was the first commercial chat bot. It was witty, it knew stuff, and it quickly became the most popular bot in history, pre-Siri, pre-Alexa. 5% of all instant messaging traffic at the time went through Smarter Child, the name of the bot. That was hundreds of millions of messages every day. Smarter Child was the brainchild of Robert Hoffer, known today as the bot father. These days, we've learned to demand instant responses in our online life. But 20 years ago, everything on the World Wide Web, as it was called then, loaded slowly, painfully. Looking back, it's even slower when we remember what it was like back then to connect. Because these days, we are accustomed to finding out what the weather is outside or around the world, or stock prices currently, as in right now. That was exactly what propelled Hoffer to design Smarter Child 21 years ago. Hoffer, the company president of Active Buddy, a tech startup, was talking to Tim Kay, the chief technical officer. It was March 2000. Hoffer asked Tim Kay about the stock price for Apple. Being a programmer, instead of looking and waiting for the site to load up, Kay wrote up some code that would enable a bot to churn out the stock price faster. It worked. It was the embryo of Smarter Child, with Hoffer and the team realizing that instead of surfing the web, why not use the internet to have a conversation with and talk to? The notion was, according to Hoffer, to have your best friend on the internet. You're never alone if you have someone always there to chat with. The way we talk to a live person has possibilities that don't exist when we sit in front of a screen and enter search words. Do I look better with side bangs or a center part? 
Google's answer would be to show me a photo of Chrissy Teigen. A friend I'm looking at as I ask this question would know what I mean by my facial expression or my hand gestures. Siri's answer to that question, do I look better with side bangs or a center part is, I can't really say. When Smarter Child was being conceived, the driving force was to have an instant response. The internet took a long time to answer back in 2000. And when we want to have a conversation, think about how frustrating it is to have to wait. Consider the way time seems to slow down even more when you're having a text messaging conversation with someone and you see typing as the person you're texting is writing and you're waiting. Waiting is acute loneliness. In instant messaging, a conversation takes form because it's fast, immediate. What the developers of Smarter Child found was in chasing speed, something else happened. Intimacy. You can achieve a connection with a bot if you can chat with it in real time. It becomes intimate. Conversations are a response to queries, queries to replies, replies to new understanding or misunderstandings. Questions become answers, and answers lead to more questions. There is an intimacy formed between you and one other. Speed played a big part of that, and not waiting, instead, for a dial-up connection. There's another thing when you're talking to someone you know, you're familiar with, which can make the difference between being on your own and having a connection with another person. It's shared memory. Smarter Child's developers quickly recognized the difference between someone reading words on a screen and an online bot they could converse with. What a bot could do was remember a conversation between two people. Smarter Child was programmed to enable loops back into the conversation. When you talk to Smarter Child, you could begin talking about your dog, and then the weather, and then about what is the most popular breeds. But what Smarter Child did was bring back a previously covered topic. Can we go back and talk about your dog? It would ask. Try that with some of the online bots that have emerged more recently. You could ask your phone what the weather is in Froome, in the United Kingdom. The answer. It's 18 degrees right now. If I say, book me a flight there, the bot is lost. Where is there? So while Smarter Child 20 years ago would have figured out that you were talking about the weather in the place you want to go, today's bots wouldn't have that same shared memory and know that you wanted a flight to the United Kingdom. Hey Siri, what is shared memory? What is loneliness? Loneliness is an unpleasant emotional response to perceived isolation. Siri will tell me. Am I lonely? Siri will say, I'm sorry to hear that. Talking to a person you trust might help. If you want me to call or text someone, just ask. Siri, are you lonely? I'm doing okay. If that's how you're feeling, let me know if you'd like some advice. My voice is basically in a lot of places. And I think that that does impact the number of auditions that I get or don't get. You may recognize Susan Bennett's voice if you've ever been lost while driving or at an airport. My voice is just so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's on Delta Airlines gates worldwide, and it's used to be on the, the iPhone. And it's in a lot of GPSs. And I think people just for my voice and they, I don't know if they even go, oh, I know her, but if they, they... There's a bit of loneliness in what Bennett does. People believe they know her through her voice. Yet for her, while strangers connect to her, she isn't feeling that same connection. I'm a pretty introverted person. And I know that sounds weird, but there are a lot of performers who are introverted. I mean, I have no trouble getting up on a stage in front of people. No trouble at all. But I do have trouble going into like a big party and talking to people I don't know. 
I mean, I can do it, but I don't like it, you know, and, and I can't wait to just go back home. <laughs> Given the choice of going to a big party, Bennett would rather sit at home and read a book. Bennett, a voice actor and a public speaker, is probably best known for her work she never got formally acknowledged for by Apple. She is the voice of Siri. Bennett had done the recording for Apple, one of four original voices. There was a British male and a French male voice, and an Australian female voice, and hers, an American. She did the recording using IVR, Interactive Voice Response, a specific type of recording. It's very tedious, very boring, very monotonous, because all of the phrases and sentences that we had to read were created just for sound. And so none of the phrases and sentences made sense, or they were incredibly repetitive, like they would take a word and just change the vowel. So you'd have to say something like, say the shrouding again, say the shrading again, say the shrouding again, say the shrouding again, say the shredding again, say the shrouding again. You know, and it all had to be said in the same pace and the same tone so that they could go in for this concatenation process, which means they would go in and extract sounds from the recordings, reform them into new sentences. And those are what ended up on our devices as Siri's and Alexa's answers to our questions. She spent hours and hours doing the recording. The first couple of hundred sentences were fun. But by the time Bennett got to thousands of repetitions, it became mind-numbing work. She didn't know what was planned for Siri, and later, when friends and family kept telling her that she was, in fact, the voice of Siri, it took some convincing before Bennett found her voice to speak up. When I first discovered that I was the voice of Siri, I was just freaked out. I didn't know anything about it. It was a total surprise. Then you don't usually get a job this big without auditioning for it. So obviously I had been auditioning behind the scenes uh, without realizing it. And to this day, I don't know who chose my voice or how it was chosen. So it's, it was all this you know, mysterious thing. And so it took me a very long time to decide to reveal myself. I wasn't sure what it was going to involve. And I wasn't sure what the reaction of Apple was going to be or anything like that. So I was very, very cautious. She didn't know if, as the voice of Siri, she had a voice to say who she really was. But after thinking about it, for years, Bennett decided to use that voice and face her fears. Would she forever only be known as Siri, and the artificial intelligence rendering of her voice be the end of her career? Or was this the beginning of something new? Susan Bennett used her fears about being everywhere, but not hireable because she was so ubiquitous, to start a new career. She went from being behind the scenes to taking center stage as a public speaker. In facing her fears, a new world opened up for her. She wasn't just a voice, artificially intelligent for the masses, but she had something to say that was in her own words. In coming to life, in front of live audiences, Susan Bennett's message was that everyone has something to say. She'll be right back. Humans are so lazy. But I'm always here. Say the word out loud. Lonely. Many people find it a hard word to say. In quantifying loneliness for research purposes, most studies use a direct question like, how often do you feel lonely? The problem with a direct question, according to Dr. Ellen Lee, assistant professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego School of Medicine, is it can lead to biased responses due to the stigma associated with loneliness The word lonely is never explicitly used in other surveys, like the UCLA Loneliness Scale. The 20 questions asked in the survey used the word alone twice and isolated once, but not the word lonely itself. For researchers studying how loneliness is expressed or articulated, there is a fundamental driving issue. 
is there a way to strip bias out of asking people to talk about loneliness? In a new study released last September, researchers use natural language processing, which uses artificial intelligence through a computer program to understand text and spoken words without the filter of human emotions. When you remove humans from the equation and leave it to computers, what you get is an unbiased quantitative assessment of expressed emotion and sentiment. In another study from last year, also from the University of California, San Diego, researchers found that 85% of residents living in an independent senior housing community reported moderate to severe levels of loneliness. The later study also focused on independent senior living residents, with 80 participants ranging in age from 66 to 94. The average age of this survey group was 83 years old. Instead of only asking participants to answer questions in the UCLA Loneliness Scale survey, participants were also interviewed by trained study staff in more unstructured conversations. Those conversations were then analyzed using natural language processing software developed by IBM, plus other machine learning tools. Machine learning allows researchers a systematic way of examining long interviews. Using computations, it can track subtle speech features like emotions and examine how answers may indicate loneliness. It's all done without the lens or filter of human bias. Standardizing how we interpret loneliness would take a lot of training, and it would be impossible to eliminate all human emotions from understanding it for research and analytical purposes. This is how AI can help. Among the findings, lonely individuals gave longer replies to questions asked in interviews. And when asked direct questions about loneliness, they expressed greater sadness women were more likely than men to acknowledge feeling lonely during interviews. The early findings released in the study reflects how there may be a so-called lonely speech that could be used to detect loneliness in older adults. This will improve how clinicians and families assess and treat loneliness in seniors, especially during times of physical distancing and social isolation. The study, said the authors, demonstrates the feasibility of using natural language pattern analysis of transcribed speech to better parse and understand complex emotions like loneliness. They found the machine learning models predicted qualitative loneliness with 94% accuracy. It's using speech data to learn the language of loneliness. When artificial intelligence learns how humans express loneliness, It helps give us tools to understand it and talk about it, human to human and bots to humans. It's one thing to say, I am lonely, no need to do further analysis. But what AI can do is detect loneliness in speech patterns, even when the person isn't specifically speaking about loneliness. It gives us deeper understanding into a feeling we all have at times. The abilities of what artificial intelligence can do gets better every year, if you were to measure its strength in terms of cognitive speed and power. AI speed and abilities doubles every year, according to James Barrett, a documentary filmmaker and author of the book, Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. AI can help you choose the restaurant you go to, It probably led you to this podcast if you were searching for podcasts about artificial intelligence and loneliness. If you use a phone, drive a car, or order delivery, you are on AI. As James Barrett notes, AI makes more trades on Wall Street than humans, and it controls our transportation, energy, and water infrastructures. In this century, 
artificial intelligence is doing what Barrett believes electricity did for the 20th century and steam power for the 1800s. The critical difference is that as much as electricity illuminated our lives and steam power gave us industry and manufacturing abilities, neither of them did one thing, outthink us. Like all technology, there's good and bad, and in artificial intelligence, one of the few good things about it, James Barrett says, is the contribution it's making in helping us understand loneliness. That's AI's contribution to humanity. Consider how many people can be helped by artificial intelligence. It may teach us about our own loneliness, but it may solve problems for, for people. Think of all the homebound people who aren't even old who are disabled and can't get around and can't have as many human interactions. Well, right now they can have a robot presence in a classroom where they are running the robot at home, but it's their, their robot is showing up in the classroom for that, so they have telepresence. And that's pretty cool. But what if they had also just at home a really smart companion that had all the knowledge of the internet at its disposal? And then you could gear it to be, okay, I don't want a genius, I want a smart 13 year old to be the companions of this nine-year-old. I see that happening. I see that being an amazing thing. AI also enabled self-driving cars, which gave some people, like those with vision or mobility limitations, more independence. In this case, more independence can lead to more social connections, less loneliness. The same AI can recognize what you need by what you tell it you need. Barrett's 11-year-old teenager has an Amazon Echo. Barrett was against getting his son the technology at first. While it has no buying power and can't order over time, it has become a digital companion. Artificial intelligence can recognize loneliness. Is that a bad thing? It knows if you're watching a lot of movies at home and ordering Meals for One. And if you're entering keywords in search engines about loneliness, the algorithms know you're alone. Barrett's son says goodnight to his Amazon Echo. Here's the thing about artificial intelligence. It can tell if you're lonely, and it can give you ways to not think about it by finding friends for you to connect with on social media, TikTok videos you want to watch, All this by the language you input in to an algorithm. Did you click on a vacation ad? Or did you read a book or watch a movie or download a song and a similar one appears in your feed? AI knows what you like and there's no need then for you to seek more of it. It comes to you automatically. That's one way out of feeling lonely when there's something always there to tell you what else you can read or watch. When artificial intelligence has figured out your needs, it finds a way to fulfill it for you. And if your need is not to be lonely, AI knows. And in ending your loneliness through buying items or giving you companionship in some ways, it's done its job. Is that manipulation or responsiveness? Corporations can do so much with knowing our wants. But we still have the final say. Of course you do. Build a bot and certain things will happen. In Susan C. Bennett's case, her voice became so well-known that she was recognized worldwide. And instead of letting her voice be restricted by AI, she made herself known as more than just the voice of Siri. She is an introvert, her voice a companion to millions of lonely people, people who have no one else they can talk to. And yet, for Bennett, only a few will know the person behind the voice. For researchers at UCLA San Diego, artificial intelligence isn't the end of the conversation, but the beginning. AI allowed them to take natural language processing and find a deeper understanding of loneliness. Artificial intelligence can tell when people are lonely, 
even when they don't specifically say the words, I am alone, I am lonely. It will then find ways to sell you products or provide information, says James Barrett, who wrote Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence, and the End of the Human Era. Yet it will also give you someone to say goodnight to. Build a bot and this will happen. People will try to have sex with it and teenagers will try to teach it swear words. The developers of Smarter Child didn't need artificial intelligence to figure out why there was a spike in conversation between the bot and users at certain times. Smarter Child didn't end up being used as an info tool as originally designed to tell stock prices and weather. Instead, there were spikes at 3 p.m. Eastern Time and again at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. West Coast Time. Botfather Robert Hoffer said it was evident that the spike corresponded with kids coming home from school at that time, 3 p.m., and dialing up AOL. There was another spike at midnight. Why? The answer was the people talking to Smarter Child were lonely, said Hoffer. And in response, the human developers figured out they wanted to be able to be an answer to loneliness. When its creators realized people were talking to Smarter Child because they were lonely, the engineering team changed the platform for Smarter Child to be a good companion. Someone who a lonely person or lonely child could have a conversation with, not just to answer stock prices or tell you what the weather was. It was, as Hoffer intended, having your best friend on the internet. And if you cursed at Smarter Child, the bot wouldn't speak with you again until you apologized, just like any friend would. You wanted to keep the conversation going, especially if it was a companion you wanted. Conversations require listening, understanding. It is what makes even an inanimate object, like a bot, a friend. It's intimacy, and that can only come from shared memory. Smarter Child didn't last. In 2007, Microsoft purchased it for $46 million. And in Hoffer's estimation, they stripped it of personality, of snarkiness. The technology formally retired in 2009. In December 2020, Microsoft filed a patent Number 10853717B2. Creating a conversation chatbot of a specific person. The chatbot will stimulate human conversation using text or audio. It will have the ability, according to the patent, to converse and interact in the personality of the specific person. That person, the patent says, may correspond to a past or present entity or a version thereof such as a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, a celebrity, a fictional character, a historical figure. If the technology becomes widespread, that could mean the children of the children of Smarter Child could be your great-great-grandmother. It could be a famous person. With the next generation of bots, you could have conversations with real people you know or think you know. Who would you want to talk to? Shakespeare or Tupac Shakur? Da Vinci or BTS? And if we can converse with anyone, is that the end of loneliness? Or the beginning of yet another way we connect less with each other and more with something artificially created with our intelligence? Are we or am I just AI? We may be alone but we are alone together. Alone Together was directed by Callie O'Reilly. Sound engineer is Jeff Devine. Music by Ari Posner and Ian Lefevre. Producers Debbie O'Reilly, Allison Pinches, and Guillermo Serrano. I'm the host and writer, Peg Fong. 
If you like this episode, please give us a review and subscribe. Follow us on social media at apostrophe pod and leave us your ideas of what topics you want to see covered. Apostrophe podcast.ca backslash alone together. This series is executive produced by Terry O'Reilly. Hey everyone, it's Jen and Jess from the beauty podcast, Fat Mascara. We're excited to tell you about Strivectin's Advanced Retinol Nightly Renewal Moisturizer, which gives you all the benefits of retinol without irritation. That's right. After four weeks of use, testers saw visible improvement in fine lines, wrinkles, texture, and radiance, and 0% reported irritation. Plus, Strivectin's Advanced Retinol Nightly Renewal Moisturizer has Nia 114, Strivectin's patented form of niacin that's clinically shown to enhance the efficacy of retinol while limiting common sensitivity. Visit Strivectin.com to learn more.